Researchers in Turkey tested 50 patients with acne against 36 control subjects and found that dietary glycemic index and dietary glycemic load levels were significantly higher in acne patients. Conversely, a low glycemic diet has been shown to positively impact acne by downregulating androgens and IGF-1, thereby decreasing inflammation and reducing the size of the sebaceous glands. Welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. I'm your host, Lee Brandon. This work started for me several decades ago when I started to see the impact I could make on people, helping them to identify the root cause of their health problems that no doctor could figure out, including serious back, knee, shoulder and neck injuries, acne and eczema issues, severe gut health problems, even helping couples get pregnant after several IVF treatments had failed. And it really moves me to be able to help people in this way. And that is why I do what I do and why we have this show. Welcome to another solo episode of the Radical Health Rebel podcast entitled Tried Everything, Yet You Still Have Acne, Part 2. So in part one of Tried Everything, Yet You Still Have Acne, I explained the good, the bad and the ugly of acne. And if you haven't listened to that episode yet, I suggest you go back and listen to that first before listening to this one. So really what I'm going to be covering today is, so what really causes acne? To understand what causes acne, we need to take a dive into some technical information. This will get a little nerdy, but I will do my best to simplify very complex ideas and will attempt to make it as easy to understand as possible. And I believe it's important to at least get an understanding of the wider complexity of acne to help you understand why you feel that you've tried everything and help you understand why nothing has worked for you until now. In this episode, I will be discussing important topics such as the the skin's acid alkaline balance or pH levels, the skin's microbiome and the link between the gut and the skin, commonly referred to as the gut-skin axis, fungal acne, the four major causes of acne by consensus, the mTOR pathway, and foods shown to cause acne in the research. So I'm going to start by talking about the skin's pH. And before I delve in to talk about that, I thought it best to define what pH is, just so that we're on the same page. In chemistry, pH historically denotes the potential of hydrogen, and it's a scale used to specify the acidity or basicity of an aqueous solution. Acidic solutions, which are solutions with uh, higher concentrations of hydrogen ions, are measured to have lower pH levels than basic or alkaline solutions. So now that we've cleared that up, let us begin. Our skin helps us protect the inside of our bodies from the external environment and preserve the loss of water from our internal environments. Our skin creates a protective barrier against bacteria, viruses, and other contaminants, and produces an acid mantle on the outermost layer of the skin, the stratum corneum. The stratum corneum is comprised of several substances, such as corneocytes, lipids, such as ceramides, fatty acids, and cholesterol, all of which form a multi-layer barrier. While the pH of healthy skin ranges from around 4 to 6, which is slightly acidic, inflamed and diseased skin tends to exhibit an increased pH, so it's alkaline. Changes in skin pH play a role in the pathogenesis of wrinkles and skin diseases, so it's important to pay attention to our skin's pH if we wish to overcome acne. The human body has pH levels ranging from 1 to 8, 1 being the most acidic, 7 being neutral, and 14 being the most alkaline. pH levels differ in different parts of the body. The following are some examples of average pH levels in the body. So stomach acid is 1 to 1.5, the stratum corneum is 4 to 6, the blood 7.35 to 7.45, 
and the urine 6.5 to 8. The skin's pH is maintained by metabolic and cellular processes that regulate protons, including a sodium hydrogen exchanger, free fatty acids made from phospholipids, free amino acids created by phalagrin degradation, and epidermal lactate produced by lactate dehydrogenase. This means that the skin's pH is maintained by several processes involving protons in the cells, minerals, fats and amino acids from skin cells and enzymes on the skin surface. A range of enzymes are crucial in maintaining a low pH, including lipases, glycoside hydrolases and sphingomyelinases. However, when skin pH increases, these enzymes are not fully activated. Instead, enzymes involved in the degradation of the stratum corneum are enhanced, leading to a breakdown in skin barrier integrity. The acidic pH of skin plays several important roles, including creating a physical barrier, preventing overcolonization of bacteria and yeasts, including Cutibacterium acnes, lipid synthesis and aggregation, so making and adding lipids or fats, epidermal desquamation, which is skin shedding, ceramide metabolism, so ceramides are a family of waxy lipids. Both endogenous or internal and exogenous or external factors influence the skin's pH. Some endogenous factors cannot be changed, but exogenous factors give you many options when trying to shift the pH of your skin. Endogenous factors include age, region of the body, ethnicity and gender, whilst exogenous factors include the climate, products used on the skin, microbiome and diet. In the modern world, we use soaps and shampoos to clean our bodies of bacteria and unwanted smells. However, soaps and shampoos are generally alkaline and their use causes an increase in our skin's pH. Washing with water can cause a rising pH that will take six hours to normalize and the use of alkaline soaps raises pH even higher. In one study, a topical lotion with 1% of sodium lauryl sulfate or SLS was added to the skin as SLS is an irritant to the skin to see the impact that pH would have on the ability to tolerate irritation. SLS impaired the skin barrier overall, but had the greatest impact on pH 8 skin, so slightly uh, alkaline. Researchers suggest that acidic skin is better able to tolerate external irritants and stress than alkaline skin. A person's age has an impact on pH with the first month of life, as well as the elderly, having a higher average pH than other ages. Aging skin is known to have a higher pH as well as a lower stratum corneum lipid content and excessively dry skin is a common problem amongst the elderly. It's believed that a higher pH activates enzymes involved in uh, barrier lipid degradation, such as ceramidase. Some studies have shown that men tend to have a slightly uh, lower pH than women overall. Another study of 300 healthy males and females from age 20 to 74 showed that on average, men's pH was below 5 and women's pH was higher than 5. Sebum production in males is significantly higher uh, than in women and trans epidermal water loss was lower in men than women of the same age, meaning their skin maintains more of the crucial moisture. Sebum levels in men are 20% greater on the forehead and 70% greater on the cheeks on average than that of women. Sebaceous gland activity in males has been shown to be relatively constant regardless of age, whereas in females, a reduction in sebum production occurs around the age of 40. The acidity of the skin varies depending on the location on the body, as well as physiologic holes of the acid mantle that exist in certain locations. Areas like the armpit, groin and below the breasts tend to have a higher pH compared to other locations. 
odor-causing bacteria can thrive in these zones. So many deodorants contain citrates, which reduce pH to make it inhospitable to these bacteria. Candida also thrives in this more alkaline environment, often appearing in inter intertriginous zones, which are the areas the skin might touch or rub, like the insides of elbows, the backs of the knees, and under the breasts. Different areas on the same part of the body can have different pH levels. In one study of the T-zone, which is the forehead, nose, and chin, and the U-zone, which is both cheeks, it was found that the average pH of the T-zone was higher than the U-zone at 5.66 versus 5.53 respectively. Acne is a skin disease known to involve a disrupted skin barrier and increased pH. Researchers studied 200 patients with acne and 200 controls with healthy skin. Normal pH was defined as 4.5 to 5.5 for women and 4 to 5.5 for men. They found that 93% of the participants in the control group had an overwhelmingly normal pH, whereas 77% of those in the acne group were much more likely to have a higher than normal pH. QT bacterium acnes is a skin commensal or friendly bacteria known to be associated with acne. This bacteria prefers a pH of 6 to 6.5 and has markedly reduced uh, uh, growth at a lower pH. One study revealed that the use of alkaline soap versus acidic products affected the number of outbreaks. The alkaline soap using group had an increase in the number of acne lesions, while the acidic group had a reduction. Reducing skin pH reduces the uh, TH2 inflammatory response, and there is evidence that topical antibiotics, such as erythromycin, reduce the skin pH, which may help explain their short-term effectiveness. So as you can see, the skin pH plays a vital role in its overall health and in the role of acne. In part two of my book, Eliminating Adult Acne for Good, I show you ways to optimize your skin's pH. So next I'm going to talk about the skin microbiome. So your skin functions as an exterior surface between the human body and the environment, acting as a physical barrier to prevent the invasion of foreign microbes while providing a home for the commensal microbiota. The harsh physical landscape of skin, particularly the dry, nutrient-poor, acidic environment, also contributes to the adversity that pathogens face when colonizing human skin. Despite this, the skin is colonized by a diverse microbiota. Our skin is completely coated in microbes. There are approximately one million bacteria composed of hundreds of species on every square centimeter of our body. Our skin is home to millions of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that compose the skin microbiota. Skin microorganisms have essential roles in the protection against invading pathogens, the education of our immune systems, and the breakdown of natural products like the microbes of our gut. As the largest organ in the human body, the skin is colonized by beneficial microorganisms, but when the barrier is broken or the balance between commensals and pathogens is disturbed, skin disease or even systemic disease can result. Studying the composition of the microbiota at different sites may be valuable for finding the cause of most skin disorders, such as acne, as well as eczema, dermatitis, or psoriasis. Structurally, the skin is composed of two distinct layers, the epidermis and the dermis. The outermost, the epidermis, is comprised of layers of differentiated keratinocytes. The top layer of the epidermis or the stratum corneum is composed of terminally differentiated enucleated keratinocytes, also known as squames, that are chemically cross-linked to fortify the barrier of the skin. 
Now, a keratinocyte is a cell of the epidermis that produces keratin. Sweat glands are important for the maintenance of body temperature through the evaporation of water, which also acidifies the skin, making conditions unfavorable for the growth and colonization of certain microorganisms. Sweat contains antimicrobial molecules such as free fatty acids and antimicrobial peptides that inhibit microbial colonization. Connected to the hair follicle and denser in oily sites, the sebaceous glands secrete lipid-rich sebum, a hydrophobic coating that lubricates and provides an antibacterial shield for hair and skin. The type of microbial communities on the skin is dependent on the physiology of the skin site with changes in the relative abundance of the types of bacteria associated with moist, dry, and sebaceous microenvironments. Highly sebaceous sites, such as the face, the chest, and the back, are dominated by lipophilic propionic bacterium species. So lipophilic means having an affinity for lipids, such as fats. Bacteria that thrive in a humid environment such as the Staphylococcus and Coronibacterium species were most abundant in moist areas, including the bends of the elbows and the feet. Fungal community composition is similar across core body sites, regardless of its physiology. So if you have ever wondered, as, as I did, why you only tend to get acne on the face, chest and back, and not on the arms, legs, or lower torso. It's likely because the face, chest, and back are sebaceous sites dominated by the acne-related propionic bacterium species of bacteria, and it's the cutie bacterium acnes that's a member of the propionic bacterium species. Now, fungi of the genus uh, Malassezia predominate on the core and arms whereas foot sites are colonized by a more diverse combination of Malassezia, Aspergillus, Cryptococcus, Rhodoterola, Epicoccum, and other species. Compared to the intestines, the skin lacks many nutrients beyond basic proteins and lipids. To survive in such a cool, acidic, and dry environment, our skin's resident microbiota has adapted to utilize resources present in sweat, sebum, and the stratum corneum. See, acnes, for example, can thrive in the anoxic, which means greatly deficient in oxygen sebaceous gland, using proteases to liberate the amino acid arginine from the skin proteins and lipases to degrade the triglyceride lipids in sebum. This releases free fatty acids, which promote bacterial adherence. Sebum levels on the cheek are abundant with propionic bacterium species. The Malassezia species of fungi is the most abundant fungal organism on the skin. It coexists with C. acnes and other bacteria. Malassezia is the fungus thought to cause fungal acne. One study showed acne lesions were significantly reduced after administration of antifungal drugs. The authors suggested that malassezia and not C. acnes was potentially the cause of acne not responding to treatment. The findings from several other studies support this hypothesis. One study reported that malassezia restrictor and malassezia globosa can be isolated from young acne patients. Another study showed the lipase activity of malassezia is around 100 times higher than that of P. acnes. Malassezia can increase fatty acid production, increase skin cell development in the hair follicles, potentially leading to a blockage and increase inflammation via activation of an immune response. It's the immune response that causes the acne lesions redness. How much malassezia levels are affected on the skin via the gut-skin axis is unclear, but it's not beyond the scope of possibility that a malassezia 
uh, overgrowth in the gut may be capable of relocating from the gut to the skin via the gut skin axis. It's important, therefore, to optimize your gut microbiome, which is covered in chapter six of my book, whether you have bacterial or fungal acne. Litzer was a 30-year-old professional woman suffering from severe acne and scarring. She was in utter despair and didn't know where to turn. She worried that her partner might leave her because of her skin, and Litzer's condition was as bad as I've ever seen. Following testing, it was found that Litzer had toxoplasma, as well as food sensitivities to gluten and soy. Litzer was a great client to work with. She jumped in and followed the program almost 100% to the letter. She cut out the foods that she was sensitive to. She had infrared saunas as advised and used the recommended essential oils. After working with me, Litzer reported how much her skin had improved and how she had much more confidence. She's also gone on to marry her partner and started a family. If you would like to achieve the same kind of results as Litsa, you can now follow a comprehensive step-by-step guide in my brand new book, Eliminating Adult Acne for Good, available now from all major online bookstores and via my website at www.bodycheck.co.uk forward slash books. Looking at the gut skin axis, Chronic skin conditions such as acne are complex and affected by many factors. Current evidence offers insight into how the the skin and gut microbiome are connected. There is evidence the gut microbiome influences other organ systems and it has a particularly complex connection to the skin. Commensal or friendly bacteria in the gut may help modulate systemic immunity and reduce inflammation, which has an impact on skin health. For example, short-chain fatty acids are produced by commensal gut microbes when they ferment dietary fiber. Short-chain fatty acids regulate the life cycle of immune cells and have a protective role against the development of inflammatory disorders. This is relevant as acne has an inflammatory component. Another short-chain fatty acid butyrate can positively modulate the activity of inflammatory cells such as cytokines and suppress inflammatory immune responses and therefore acne. Under certain conditions, commensal bacteria can undergrow and pathogenic bacteria and other microbes can thrive. This creates a dysbiosis, which is an imbalance in the amounts and types of bacteria in the gut which can have a negative impact on your health. Chemicals produced by these gut microbes may enter the bloodstream, build up in the skin and impair skin health. This may occur due to the increased gut permeability, otherwise known as a leaky gut syndrome. If you have a healthy, diverse gut microbiome, it greatly increases if not ensures your health. Research has suggested a dysbiotic gut microbiome leads to disease and may be associated with skin disorders. Rather than addressing the skin alone, it's crucial to consider the role of the gut microbiome in skin conditions, including acne. There is evidence that acne is an inflammatory disease and gut health may play a role in its development. Low levels of stomach acid are often associated with acne and a more alkaline gastric pH enables bacteria from the colon to access the small intestine. This can cause gut dysbiosis, malabsorption of nutrients, and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, known as SIBO. Nutrient malabsorption may play a role in development of acne, as bacterial overgrowth competes with cells in your body for nutrients, impairing the absorption of nutrients to your cells. Studies have suggested the malabsorption of micronutrients such as folate, chromium, selenium, omega-3 fatty acids and zinc is associated with the development of acne. The production of toxic metabolites resulting from SIBO can increase gut permeability or leaky gut syndrome, leading to systemic inflammation with an association with acne. 
Factors associated with a modern lifestyle, such as antibiotic use, psychological and physical stress, and diet can adversely affect the gut microbiome, leading to gut dysbiosis and its downstream effects. As I alluded to earlier, research has shown that antibiotic use can significantly cause unfavorable changes in the balance of the commensal gut microbes, leading to an increased susceptibility to pathogenic microbes in the gut, an overgrowth of fungi or Clostridium difficile, and reduced production of short-chain fatty acids. Stress also exerts unfavorable changes in the gut, including a decreased release of stomach acid and changes in gut motility, either constipation and or diarrhea, creating an environment less favorable to the proliferation of beneficial bacteria. Psychological stress lowers mucin production uh, in the gut, decreases immunoglobulin A or IgA. So IgA is is an antibody and it causes a substantial and ongoing increase in stress hormones, all of which can lower defenses against pathogenic microbes in the gut, allowing for their proliferation. Therefore, reducing overall stress and having stress reduction behaviors in place, such as meditation, yoga, tai chi, or qigong, is strongly advised. Dietary intake shapes the makeup and metabolic activities of gut microbes. Some diets promote the proliferation of beneficial microbes, while other diets lead to unhealthy gut microbiome activity. A varied diet maximizes your nutrition and gut microbiome. Dietary restriction and the overuse of elimination diets can decrease gut microbiome diversity and introduce you to potential nutrient deficiencies. So what causes acne? Well, according to the UK's NHS website, it states, and I quote, acne myths, despite being one of the most widespread skin conditions, Acne is also one of the most poorly understood. There are many myths and misconceptions about it. In inverted commas, acne is caused by poor diet. So far, research has not found any any foods that cause acne. Eating a healthy diet is recommended because it's good for your heart and your health in general. End of quote. I share this information because it's further evidence of my claims in part one of this episode that the current medical paradigm does not believe that diet is related to acne and there's no research suggesting food can cause acne and i'll come back and talk about this a bit later as we know acne usually begins around the time of puberty adolescent males are more likely to have acne than females because of the effects of testosterone Now, while most acne occurs in teenagers, 40 to 54% of men and women older than 25 will have some degree of facial acne and clinical facial acne persists into middle age in 12% of women and 3% of men. Now, genetic factors or propensities do play a role in acne. One study suggests that if both parents have acne, three out of four children will likely have acne as well. If one parent has acne, then one out of four of the children are also likely to have acne. Now, I would, however, add that, you know, this does not prove a genetic propensity to acne, as it may be the parents with acne taught their children the same behaviors or lived in the same environment that caused their acne. Many experts consider acne to be androgen dependent, and an excess of androgens, either systemic or local, local meaning on the skin, is associated with more severe forms of the disease. Androgens control sebum secreted from the sebaceous gland and exacerbate development of abnormal keratinization by the follicular epithelium. What this means is, is that androgens increase the production of the greasy, sticky sebum and skin cells. One research paper suggests endocrine disorders producing excess androgens are important causal factors, which include idiopathic adrenal androgen excess, 
partial defect in 21 hydroxylase and polycystic ovary syndrome. If you have any of these conditions, it's likely they play a role in the cause of your acne. According to research, free testosterone, dehydroepiandrosterone, or DHEA, dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate, or DHEAS, and low sex uh, hormone binding globulin have all been implicated in acne. Greater activity of the enzyme 5 alpha reductase, which converts testosterone to the stronger androgen dehydrotestosterone or DHT, has been found in the skin of acne patients. The increased 5 alpha reductase activity is independent of systemic levels of androgens, which may explain the poor correlation between systemic levels of androgens and the severity of acne lesions. Receptors for growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1, are present in the sebaceous gland. These hormones also stimulate sebum production. Conditions of growth hormone excess, such as agromegaly, are associated with increased sebum production and acne. At high levels, insulin can also play a role by interacting with IGF-1 receptors which promote the expression of enzymes responsible for antigen biosynthesis and conversion. Exposure to industrial pollutants or certain medications can also increase the likelihood of acne, as well as everyday toxins such as mercury, cadmium and PCBs. Medications and compounds that can cause acne lesions include corticosteroids, halogens, isonicotonic acid, diphenylhydantoin, lithium carbonate anabolic steroids, and immunotherapeutic agents. Lifestyle choices and exposures that can cause acne lesions include machine oils, coal tar derivatives used especially as industrial fuels in making dyes and in the topical treatment of skin disorders, chlorinated hydrocarbons used in insecticides, Cosmetics, pomades, which is a perfumed ointment, especially a fragrant uh, hairdressing, overwashing, and also repetitive rubbing. It's for these reasons it's important to identify any toxins in your environment and, where possible, know how to safely remove the toxins that have been stored in your cells. This is covered in chapters seven and eight of my book, Eliminate Adult Acne for Good. Now, according to medical consensus, there are four major causes of acne. Hyperseborrhea, which is excess sebum uh, production and the changes in the sebum lipid profile. Abnormal follicular keratinization, which is excess skin production. C. acnes proliferation in the pilosebaceous gland. And finally, inflammation in response to the C. acnes proliferation. Around the time of puberty, increased androgen levels stimulate sebum production, and this can change the lipid profile of the sebum itself. The rise in androgens also increases the production of keratin by the cells lining the follicular canal. The formation of acne lesions begins in the upper portion of the follicular canal at the pore. The first microscopic change is increased keratinization by the cells lining the follicular canal. Over time, this forms a follicular plug that blocks the canal and forms a comedone. Whether an open or closed comedone is formed depends on the degree of keratinization and blockage of the duct. Open comedones, which we call blackheads, form because the blockages cause the sebum to move to the surface of the pore. The sebum oxidizes to a black color, giving the open comedone its characteristic color. When the duct is completely blocked, sebum becomes trapped beneath the surface, forming a closed comedone, which we call a whitehead. These events, in combination with inflammation caused by factors like physical irritation, diet, stress, and cosmetics, can cause disruptions to the skin barrier. Inflammation and a compromised skin barrier encourage the colonization of the commensal bacteria C. acnes, 
which plays a key role in the formation and progress of acne lesions. The severity of acne lesions is thought to be determined by this complex interaction between hormones, keratinization, sebum, and bacteria. Another theory of the cause of acne is via what's called the mTOR pathway. So the cause of acne is multifactorial, including a wide array of genetic and environmental factors. It's a disease found primarily in Western societies that is completely absent in hunter-gatherer societies whose diets often include vegetables, meat and fruit, and often lack dairy, sugar and refined grains. The mammalian target of rapamycin, or mTOR, is a pathway that has shown a strong role in the pathogenesis of acne, and research shows a connection between a Western diet, mTOR, and acne. The mTOR is a complex pathway, often referred to as the PL3K AKT mTOR pathway, which manages cellular energy and survival by monitoring both intra- and extracellular signals. Phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase, or PL3K, and protein kinase B, or AKT, are upstream modulators of mTOR, and together all three create the PL3K AKT mTOR pathway. The mTOR pathway includes two distinct multi protein complexes mTOR complex 1, or mTORC1, and mTOR complex 2, or mTORC2. An important element in the pathway is a fork head box transcription factor 1, or FOX01, which inhibits the mTOR pathway when it's located in the nucleus, but becomes inactive when it's exported out of the nucleus into the cytosol of the cell. The cytosol is the fluid portion of the cytoplasm exclusive of the organelles and membranes, also called the ground substance. PL3K, AKT, mTOR, along with FOX01, all work together to monitor the nutritional status of the cell and regulate a wide range of biological functions in the cell, including cell growth, cell proliferation, cell survival, cell metabolism, cell cycle progression, gene transcription, and protein synthesis. Metabolic homeostasis is in large part regulated by the cellular sensing of nutrients. An abundance or lack of nutrients either signals the cell to grow or conserve resources. mTORC1 is rapamycin sensitive and a main driver of cell growth by upregulating anabolic processes and downregulating catabolic processes. Increased activation of mTORC1 has been associated with a wide variety of diseases, including cancer, diabetes, insulin resistance, obesity, melanoma, and acne. mTORC2 is also involved in cellular growth and metabolism. However, it is rapamycin insensitive and far less is known about it than mTORC1. It's involved in cell polarity and the organization of the cytoskeleton in the cell, but the precise mechanism is still unknown. Then there's FOXO1, which is an mTORC1 inhibitor. FOXO1 is a transcription factor involved in metabolism regulation found in all mammalian tissue. It modulates the expression of genes across a wide array of functions, including uh, glucose and lipid metabolism, cell differentiation, inflammation, and DNA damage repair. FOXO1 is active in the cell's nucleus, but can be inhibited when exported into the cell's cytoplasm. In the nucleus, FOXO1 actively inhibits cell growth and metabolism. However, when it's extruded into the cytosol due to being a high nutrient sensing in the cell, it's effectively inactivated, so the cell enters an anabolic state. Both IGF-1 and insulin have been shown to inhibit nuclear FOXO1 levels. In the nucleus, FOXO1 performs the following functions. Inhibits hepatic IGF-1 synthesis, 
inhibits lipogenesis via transcription factor SRBP1C, inhibits protein synthesis, inhibits antigen signaling, inhibits T cell activation and interleukin 1 activity, enhances antimicrobial peptide synthesis, and reduces oxidative stress. Put into simple terms, or in English, FOXO1 in the nucleus of a cell reduces the likelihood of acne, and when outside the nucleus in the cell cytosol, increases the likelihood of acne as it allows an anabolic state and triggers an immune response and inflammation. IGF-1 and insulin inhibit nuclear FOXO1 levels and therefore increase the likelihood of acne. I'll soon explain why IGF-1 and insulin are so important. Esther was in her 40s when I met her through a friend. She had really bad breakouts and was very embarrassed about her skin. Her acne was so bad that even applying makeup couldn't conceal it, and she tried many different facials and cleaning routines without success. Esther purchased the first edition of my book, Axe Adult Acne, after chatting with me, and in a very short period of time, she improved her diet, especially reducing sugar and flour intake, and she noticed a great improvement very quickly, which greatly improved her confidence levels. She now uses much less makeup than before because she doesn't need to conceal her acne. And suffice to say, she was very pleased with the progress in a short period of time and looked forward to continued improvements and a further reduction in the frequency and severity of breakouts as she made her way through the book. If you'd like to achieve the same kind of result as Esther, you can now follow a comprehensive step-by-step guide in my brand new book, Eliminating Adult Acne for Good, available now from all major online bookstores and via my website at www.bodycheck.co.uk forward slash books. So what activates the mTOR pathway? The mTOR pathway is activated in response to many endogenous signals, such as hormones and growth factors, and exogenous factors, such as nutrients. mTORC1 drives cell growth and is influenced by several main signals, including growth factors, amino acids, lipids, energy status, inflammation, and oxygen. Growth factors activate mTOR through a variety of signals, beginning with the binding of insulin and IGF-1 to surface receptors on the cell. High levels of insulin and IGF-1 can activate AKT, which can phosphorylate, meaning to combine with phosphoric acid, uh, FOXO1, and lead to the exportation of FOXO1 into the cytosol. Research has shown that people with acne have a greater expression of FOXO1 in the cytoplasm versus in the nucleus. Elevated insulin and IGF-1 can upregulate androgen receptor expression. IGF-1 levels have also been correlated with the physical manifestation of acne, and they are important to the pathogenesis of acne. Interestingly, people with uh, Laron syndrome, a condition of the congenital deficiency of IGF-1, never develop acne unless treated with recombinant IGF-1. Amino acids leucine and glutamine play pivotal roles in mTORC1 activation. Leucine is an essential amino acid and it's necessary for the activation of mTORC1 and is imported into the cell via glutamine transporters. In addition to promoting the cellular uptake of leucine, glutamine is also involved in the growth of sebocytes and the production of lipids. In addition to leucine, other branch chain amino acids such as isoleucine and valine have also been found to increase mTORC1. Palmitate, a saturated fatty acid, was also shown to activate mTORC1. Trans fats resemble the chemical structure of palmitate, and while studies on their specific impact on mTORC1 remain to be done, they have been found to increase acne. Oleic acid has also been shown to stimulate mTORC1 and mTORC2, while omega-3 fatty acids have the opposite effect and were shown to inhibit mTORC1 activation.
In terms of energy status, when ATP levels are low, AMPK downregulates the mTOR pathway. In terms of inflammation, pro-inflammatory cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-1 send signals activating mTORC1 and researchers are starting to link this process to diseases such as tumor formation and insulin resistance. In terms of oxygen status, when cells are low in oxygen, the resulting hypoxia generates multiple signals that downregulate mTORC1. So how does the mTOR pathway relate to acne? Well, the mTOR pathway is involved in the critical growth and survival functions of the cell and is a necessary component of a healthy system. However, overactivation of the pathway can result in inflammation and acne. Researchers in Italy measured the skin of 10 acne patients and 10 controls to measure the mTOR expression and found that mTOR was significantly elevated in the skin of acne patients. The lesion skin of acne patients had a 20-fold increase in the mTOR gene expression versus controls, and non-lesion skin showed only a 17-fold increase. Humans go through physiologically appropriate periods of high growth, both as babies and during puberty, And these processes are driven by an increase in insulin and IGF-1, both of which regulate mTORC1. Puberty is also a time of increased hormone production in adolescence, increasing testosterone. IGF-1 stimulates both the production of androgens as well as the conversion of testosterone to DHT, which is 10 times more active than testosterone. Acne is a skin disorder afflicting over 80% of adolescents, and it's this increased production of IGF-1 and testosterone that creates a fertile ground for the pathogenesis of acne. The sebaceous gland's function is to produce and secrete sebum that lubricates and augments the skin's barrier. A normal physiologic rise in sebum occurs from the ages of around 9 to 17 years old, corresponding to puberty. However, in acne, there's an enhanced activity of the glands as they produce an excess of sebum with an altered lipid composition. The increased IGF-1 in puberty is a part of this process and it promotes growth via sebaceous gland proliferation and lipogenesis, including sebum production. In people with acne, the PL3K AKT mTOR pathway is upregulated, increasing lipid production in the sebocytes and preventing cell death, so you end up with an increased number of skin cells. mTORC1 specifically stimulates transcription factor sterile regulatory element binding protein 1, or CREBPB1, which increases the production of sebum in the sebaceous gland. Antigens and the regulation of antigen receptors are key drivers of acne pathogenesis, and the role of the mTOR pathway in regulating the interplay between antigens, antigen receptors, and insulin and IGF-1 has been clearly demonstrated. The sebaceous gland is part of the skin most active in synthesizing steroids. Antigens contribute to acne by upregulating sebum gland growth and production, and through increasing inflammation. DHT is also shown to upregulate SREBP1, and when combined with an increased IGF-1, SREBP1 expression during puberty can result in the overproduction of sebum. The occurrence of acne in traditional hunter-gatherer populations has not been documented despite its prevalence in Western society as a normal feature of puberty. Therefore, we cannot say that acne is a normal physiological process of human adolescence. However, when these same hunter-gatherers move to urban areas and adopt a Western-style diet, they often develop acne. Over the past several years, research has shown a clear link between a Western diet 
and the pathogenesis of acne. Western diets are full of sugar and refined carbohydrates that have a high glycemic load and can cause chronic low-grade hyperinsulinemia or high levels of insulin, which are shown to impair FOX01 function. Dairy protein, a high glycemic load, and lipids can all increase insulin and IGF-1, thereby exacerbating acne. Research has shown the bioactivity of free serum androgens and free serum IGF-1 is regulated by the glycemic load of the diet with a higher glycemic load upregulating both. Refined carbohydrates and sugar contribute to high glycemic load. Researchers in Turkey tested 50 patients with acne against 36 control subjects and found that dietary glycemic index and dietary glycemic load levels were significantly higher in acne patients. Conversely, a low glycemic diet has been shown to positively impact acne by downregulating androgens and IGF-1, thereby decreasing inflammation and reducing the size of the sebaceous glands. The purpose of milk is to facilitate the rapid growth of baby mammals containing IGF-1, androgens, and amino acids. IGF-1 is found in milk, but milk also triggers the production of endogenous IGF-1 in mammals. In both adults and children, the consumption of milk raises serum IGF-1 and has been shown to be linked to hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. Milk also contains androgens that activate the mTORC1 and inhibit FOX01, leading to the proliferation of keratinocyte production and an increase in sebum production. Milk has also been shown to aid insulin in exposing androgen receptors, making a person more susceptible to circulating androgens. Dairy is also rich in leucine, glutamine and palmitic acid, all drivers of the mTOR pathway, as previously suggested. Leucine is found in both meat and dairy products, and palm palmitic acid is also found in butter and cream. Dairy is one of the highest sources of leucine, with whey protein containing 14% leucine, whereas beef contains only 8%. Dairy is one of the highest sources of leucine, with whey protein containing 14% leucine, whereas beef contains only 8%. Milk also contains approximately twice the amount of glutamine per gram as beef, with 8 grams of glutamine in milk versus only 4 grams in beef. As suggested previously, lipids can also activate mTOR. Therefore, it's unsurprising that the consumption of increased saturated fat in the diet aggravated acne in several studies. I would also add that it might not be the fat in the, in the meat per se. If the meat is not of high quality, it's likely that the fat of the meat is toxic as the mammals store toxins in their fat cells. In terms of food suggested by research that have a causal link to acne, when looking at most of the research on diet and acne, a few items seem to appear quite regularly in the literature. As we've seen above, the following nutrients are known to stimulate the mTOR pathway. So we've got glucose, amino acids, leucine, glutamine, isoleucine, and valine, and fats such as trans fats, uh, palmitate, and oleic acid. This would suggest that foods such as bread, fruit, sugar, cakes, biscuits, cookies, ice cream, sweets, candy, soft drinks, dairy products, milk, butter, cream, meat, olive oil, and nuts, especially peanuts and walnuts, could potentially be causing your acne via stimulation of the mTOR pathway. Knowing that research has identified these foods as being potentially causative of acne, does it not make you wonder how the UK's National Health Service can still suggest, and I quote, so far, research has not found any foods that can cause acne, close quote. Could it be that there is a conflict of interest somewhere in the system that doesn't want to see a reduction in profits for acne products? I'll let you make your own decision on that. 
It is worth noting that there are nutrients that help block the mTOR pathway as well. According to Dr. Julie Greenberg from the Center for Integrative Dermatology in Los Angeles, California, a number of fiber-rich foods help to block the mTOR pathway, including a number of vegetables, preferably all the colors of the rainbow, plus pomegranate, quercetin, vitamin B5, resveratrol, caffeine, which might be contraindicated generally for acne, and also uh, curcumin. So just to summarize some, some key takeaways from this episode, you know, current medical advice suggests that there's no research linking diet and acne, despite the prevalence of the evidence. The pH of the skin is crucial. The ideal healthy pH of skin is four to six, which is a slightly acidic environment. And C. acnes prefer a more alkaline environment with a pH of around 6 to 6.5. Acne sufferers have been shown to have a higher skin pH compared to non-sufferers. There are approximately a million bacteria composed of hundreds of species on every square centimeter of our bodies. Different bacteria tend to colonize in different regions of the skin. See, acnes tend to colonize in sebaceous sites such as the face, the chest, and the back. Malassezia species also seem causative of fungal acne in some people. Malassezia has been shown to increase free fatty acids in the sebum, which may affect abnormal uh, keratinization of the hair follicle ducts and increase pro-inflammatory cytokines on the skin. Gut health has been shown to play a role in acne via gut hyperpermeability, nutrient malabsorption, gut dysbiosis and the production of toxic metabolites. Excess androgens, industrial pollutants, medications and lifestyle choices have been shown to cause acne. There are four medical consensus causes of acne, being hyperseborrhea, abnormal follicular keratinization, C. acnes, proliferation and inflammation. However, other research suggests that there are more than these four factors. The mammalian target of rapamycin, or mTOR, is a pathway shown to have a strong role in the pathogenesis of acne, and research is showing a connection between Western diet, mTOR, and acne. And nutrients known to stimulate the mTOR pathway include glucose, the amino acids leucine, glutamine, isoleucine, and valine, and fats such as trans fatty acids, palmitate, and oleic acid. And this suggests that many foods in the Western diet could cause acne in those who are genetically susceptible, despite the medical establishment's denials. As I'm sure you can now appreciate, if you're one of those people feeling that you've tried everything, you can probably see how acne is a complex condition and how the causes can be quite varied and different for each person. The reason I wrote Eliminating Adult Acne for Good was for people who feel that they've tried everything and nothing has worked. In part two of the book, I take you on a journey step by step, beginning by getting your mindset right at the start of the journey, because without the right mindset, you're unlikely to follow the other recommendations and ultimately you'll be unsuccessful. In the book, I cover things like finding out what diet is right for you right for you as an individual, what foods to avoid as they're known to cause acne. I discuss food sensitivities and how your or how you identify your food sensitivities, why stress, rest and sleep are important, and how to minimize stress and optimize rest and sleep, heavy metals and heavy metal detoxes, how to balance your gut microbiome, how to identify and minimize toxins in your environment, how to eliminate toxins stored deep in your body, and finally, how to effectively cleanse the skin with daily, weekly, and monthly protocols. If you follow all the advice in the book, you will see that in fact, you haven't tried everything yet. And it's not your fault. The reason you didn't know was because your doctor probably didn't know either. Even if you don't have acne, 
you could benefit greatly by following the recommendations in the book. As I mentioned previously, clients following the recommendations in my book have reported reduced body fat, more energy, a calmer tummy, better bowel movements, sleeping better, improved concentration, more confidence, a better social life, less anxiety, less stress, feeling better about themselves, not needing to wear tons of makeup, and ultimately they feel happier. I really put my heart and soul into writing this book, and my dream for the book is to help as many people as possible overcome their acne so they can lead a more confident, fun-filled, healthy, productive, fulfilling, and happy life. So that's all from me for this week. But don't forget, you can join me same time, same place next week on the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to give the show a rating and a review, and I'll see you next time.